Hey, what's going on folks? It's Mike here and welcome to the next lesson in our SFML series. In this lesson, I'm going to be doing a little bit more live coding and building a game entity component and some different components so we can build a sort of lightweight entity component system. Now there's plenty of optimizations that we'll be able to make in the future, but really what I want to do is take the code that we've been building previously where we've have some textured sprite here and build that into a sprite 2D component and then ultimately into a game entity. It's going to help us in our future lessons, and I think it's just useful to see how we do a little bit of code organization and re-architecture. So with that said, let's go ahead and dive into this lesson. So what I've got here is, again, the project from the previous lessons here. And my goal overall is going to be able to build some system that allows me to easily create lots of different sprites and build a simple screensaver of those sprites moving around. So the high-level idea is I'm going to have some game entity class here. I could call it game entity, game object, or any of these sorts of names. And the idea is every game entity in our system will have a series of components, such as a sprite 2D. And that'll be a component. And we can have any number of those sprite components as part of our game entity here. So they'll just kind of filter in our game entity. We can have different components like audio components, physics components, colliders, and these sorts of other things that eventually make up some little character here uh, in our game. So that'll be the idea for this lesson. And just to make it a little bit interesting, we'll have a bunch of these sort of moving around for a screensaver, and then that'll set us up for some more interesting things, again, we could do in a future lesson. So with that said, let's go ahead and start designing this game entity class and ultimately a sprite component. Okay, so diving into the code here, just to show the current code structure that we have, is I have some fonts, I have a new image that I've created, which I'll go ahead and show you here, that'll serve us for our little screensaver project. Again, just a quick ghost, so go ahead and design whatever uh, object you want, or feel free to use one similar to this. Uh, we have our old Mona Lisa image, which I'm going to remove, some fonts, and I just want to organize those a little bit into different uh, assets uh, folders. So I'm going to go ahead and just make a directory here called assets and move in the font into this folder, move our ghost into this folder, and again, just provide a little bit more structure within this project. Now I could subdivide this further into an images directory or a fonts directory, and in fact, I am going to do that here. So let me go ahead and make one for fonts and another one for uh, images here. And again, as we add more to the project, we might want to further make some different uh, design decisions to move things around. So let's go ahead and move this, the fonts directory, and our ghost into images. And I'll move back up here, get rid of our Mona Lisa. And let's go ahead and just see the structure here. Again, this sort of physical file structure as our projects get larger is important. That said, let's go ahead and make some directories for our code. SRC for the source code. And because we're using C++, we'll have a include directory as well. So I'm going to go ahead and move our SFML file into source. I'm going to uh, rename this file source uh, SFML into main CPP as that sort of a uh, convention. OK, so let's go ahead and see what our directory looks like now. And it looks like this. So go ahead and pause. Take a moment if you're following along to create this hierarchy either on the terminal or in your graphical user interface. And once you've done that, let's go ahead and start sketching out what will be our design here for the game entity and the sprite 2D component. So I'm going to need a few files for that. But let's try to take things just a little bit slow and hop into uh, the main file here in source and start doing our refactoring. OK, so what I'm going to want to do here is go ahead and just look at some of the components that I needed for the actual moving image that I had here. We needed a texture and we needed a sprite. So likely those are going to be the two things that I want to package together anytime I create my sprite 2D component. So I'm going to start sketching out this header file here and then I'll separate them out into different uh, implementation and interface files um, as needed. OK, so let me just go ahead and grab these. And I'm going to put them at the top here. And let's go ahead and start creating our class 
and this is going to be a sprite 2D component. Now the name component itself has some importance in these entity component systems, which you can look up or do some further uh, research on. So let's go ahead and put this here. And what I mean by that when I talk about component is usually there is a base class which these are going to inherit from. So that way, uh, if we want, and I'm going to go ahead and just label this, that it will publicly inherit from a component class. Because we have to think about what is this data structure in a game entity that I'm actually populating. And most likely, what I'm going to default to is a vector of components. And stylistically, sometimes we put an I to indicate that this is some sort of interface here. And that way I can put any type of component, whether it's a sprite component or later if we add audio components or collider components into this actual game entity. So that's the idea here. Okay, so just sorting out a few things here. Let's go ahead and create that class for component. And this is going to be our interface. And let me go ahead and make this a little bit smaller just so you can see everything. And again, the idea is going to be this is an interface for all components. And anytime we're going to inherit here, we should make the destructor uh, a virtual destructor. And I'll just go ahead and for now put the implementation in this file because I just want to get things working first. And then again, I'll separate things out into different files. So let's go ahead and inherit here from I component. And then what we're going to do is stylistically, I like to name things M underscore texture for our uh, member variables here, just so we can delineate between what belongs to the class or what might be a local variable. Let's go ahead and create our uh, constructor. And part of our con Structure will also need a uh, destructor potentially if we are doing any sort of uh, memory allocation. And we'll have our member variables here. So these will be uh, private as well. Now I'm not going to spend too much time optimizing the C at this point because I just want to get something up and working and then I can profile and optimize later. So bear with me as I go ahead and uh, set up some of these things here. We'll have a texture and we need a sprite. And I'm just going to name this M sprite here. And we'll go ahead and just line things up. And as part of our constructor for our sprite, let's assume that it's always going to have a texture here. And let's go ahead and uh, make this a file path here. And we can pass in a string. And that's what we'll take in here, uh, just the file path. Now, I do want to check uh, in our documentation. So I'll go ahead and open up uh, SFML here and check if it uh, is a character string or a regular string. So let's go ahead and navigate to the documentation, learn our API and the classes. And we know we're working with a texture. So let's go ahead down here. And if we're going to load from file, it's just a regular standard string. So no problems there. OK, so um, what we're going to want to do here once we have this uh, texture loaded, well, we're going to want to also set up our sprite. So let's look up how to do that. I'm going to find our sprite here. And we'll have to set the texture here. So previously, we were just able to do that from the constructor as that's how it's used, but we're going to have to call a member function. So on our sprite, we will set the texture. And we can have, this is a default parameter here, but we're just going to use the uh, actual texture here and texture, which I'll make sure is consistent here. And we have our sprite component here. So let's go ahead and just observe the different changes that we've made. And then we'll go ahead and clean up the code a little bit. And then we'll actually see if this compiles with our new uh, sprite component here. OK, so with that said here, 
Um, there are going to be different things that we might want to do, like set the scale and so on. For now, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of those. And we might even want things like positions and so on. However, those are things that are going to be associated with our actual game entity class. So for now, I'm going to uh, leave this in here, but eventually we'll want to get rid of it. Previously, we did some work with limiting the frame rate and computing the frame rate. I'm going to leave that code in because I think it's nice to have and it's a useful uh, debugging tool for us. Uh, but we will want to get rid of some of this uh, code for setting the position because that's not going to compile here. Uh, because now we just have our sprite component. Okay, so if I comment out all that stuff here, let's go ahead and see if we can just create a uh, sprite. 2D component. Uh, I'm just going to call it uh, test here. And as part of our constructor, we need to link to our assets folder, images, and I'm going to use the ghost uh, PNG image that I have created here. And let's go ahead and um, we'll want to see if this works. Now, in order for this to actually render, we're going to have to think about, well, what's being displayed here. So there's different ways that we can handle this now that we have the component where I could either just directly draw, I could expose or figure out some way to get a reference to the sprite that's part of the component. What I'm actually going to do here to sort of encapsulate this behavior is just go ahead and write a render function here. And within this, well, we'll take in a reference to the render window, uh, which we have here. So we need an SF render window. So let's go ahead and do that. SF render window. And I'm going to make this a reference here. And we're simply going to want to, from our uh, reference, um, this window here called display. And we're going to want to display our sprite. All right, so let's go ahead and see if that works. See if I made any mistakes. So now I don't have to uh, directly uh, draw this. Um, let's see. So I just want to do our test and render and pass in the actual uh, window here. Um, now I believe I did make uh, one mistake here. Uh, this is just dot draw. So let me go ahead and fix that here. Draw. All right. And let's go ahead and compile. And uh, now I need to compile from the source directory dot slash source and the main file here. And remarkably, if I run this, you'll see that, well, it actually works for rendering the sprite component. Now, briefly, I do want to talk about these entity component systems here. Some of the components that we have, for example, like if I add an audio component, will not need a sort of render function. They might need something like a play sound or something different. So something that you might consider in your design is, and this could be a use case of multiple inheritance, the multiple inheritance tends to be quite dangerous, um, is also inherit from some sort of renderable uh, component or maybe break up components into a different subset. Sometimes I'll see folks do that where you uh, sort of use multiple inheritance to enforce how you build these uh, classes. In fact, you can see that, um, for instance, the SFML library, just looking at it, Sprite is inherited from drawable, which would be the same sort of idea. So you know if you have some component that is drawable or renderable, there's a render function that you can call. Why is this important? Well, just to illustrate on this little uh, tangent here, again, if I have some audio component that I eventually want to add in. So I'm just going to draw it in my collection here. Let's add another box here. Eventually, I would want to iterate through all of my game entity components and call the appropriate functions, whether that's rendering, playing the sound, checking for collision, etc., etc. So that's the idea and something that we might want to consider in a later design that I just want you to be aware of these different design decisions. For now, we're just going to go for uh, something that's a little bit more simple. OK, so with that said, now that I've got this Sprite 2D component that I think is interesting enough, let's go ahead and create a game entity class here that consists of multiple of these components. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, 
create this class here, game entity. And I'll put a semicolon here. And again, the idea is that this is just going to be sort of a holder class for us. So let's go ahead and have the constructor. And maybe we'll want some private variables. Eventually we'll want a uh, destructor in case we do any heap allocations. Uh, though we might uh, try to avoid that to keep our design clean. And as mentioned, we're going to want a vector of our uh, components here. So anything that is potentially a component. So I'm just going to call this components. And we'll need to include a uh, vector here because we're using it. We're also likely to include string. And again, once I separate these out into different files, we'll want to include the appropriate uh, library only in the files where we use vector or string. So again, just a quick coding here, and perhaps I'll leave that as an exercise, but I will eventually clean it up in this support code here. Okay, so once we have an entity, the other thing that I actually want to do here is also give our entities name so we can somehow identify them that may become important later on. Um, so I'm going to give um, just a name here that could be passed in for our entities here, a name or some sort of unique ID. Sometimes engines will use a globally unique identifier. That's a GUID uh, and those can be uh, helpful here. So we'll just set the name here. Now I could use a list initializer here and these sort of things. Uh, to optimize a little bit, but again, I'm going to leave that for future lessons or for you folks to optimize. Okay, um, so now what I'm going to want to do for each of our uh, entities um, is also create uh, positions. Um, I'm just going to call this X uh, and M, Y. These are positions of our game entity. Now, again, I probably will want to eventually create a transform component or some other class, but most, for the most part and for the purpose of this demo, everything's just going to have an X and a Y position, and I will pay that cost of however many bytes that this takes. So <laughs> just to keep things a little bit uh, simple here. And I want to have a set position that takes in a float X and a Y and sets the positions uh, accordingly here. So m of x equals x and m of y equals y. And we, again, may want to have things like setting the scale, the rotation. And again, those could be moved into a transform component. Um, and perhaps I'll do that behind the scenes or another lesson if folks would like to see that. OK, so what I'll also need to do now is as part of our game entity class here is, well, actually draw or render whatever components we have, as well as add the components here. So I'm going to have a render here. That's job is to walk through all of the renderable components. And then I also need a add component to add a new component. And there's different ways to do this where I could construct the component elsewhere. I'm going to, again, cheat a little bit and just create a add sprite component 2D here, and I'll pass in the name. Uh, this makes it a little bit easier for me to just sort of see what things could be added to the game entity. Again, you could have just a general add component and then take in the actual component here, but I don't want to have to worry about uh, things like ownership right now with our, our components um, in C++. Um, so with that said, what we're going to do is just push back a new uh, component. So let's go ahead and construct our sprite component here. And I'm going to use this one as an example. So we are making some copies. We are transferring some ownership. We could do things like uh, in placing and constructing this and so on. But uh, again, I want to make this uh, as easy as possible. Test, uh, or let me just call this uh, Sprite2D component. That's lowercase, Sprite2D component. And the file name here. So let's go ahead and, oops. Delete some of this stuff here. And I'll make this just a little bit clearer. 
And again, with your APIs, you may, again, come up with something clear, or I might change this later on just to make this uh, a little bit easier. So uh, for now, I'm just going to do this again as a loop while well, I is less than the components size I plus plus. And let's go ahead and just look at each of the components. And again, everything by default, we only have sprite component 2Ds. So everything by default uh, has a render uh, member function here. OK, so that's the uh, idea here. All right, so let's go ahead and um, I'll, I'll work with setting this position in a moment, but let's go ahead and see if I've uh, made any silly uh, or not so silly mistakes here. So if I try to uh, compile this, let's see, it says I component has no member name render. So again, this is where we get ourselves in a little bit of trouble here where I could have some virtual here uh, called render. And for now, I'm not going to make folks uh, forced to implement this, not forced to implement this to do. Uh, and again, an optional may move this to a renderable or drawable, which I actually like in SFML um, component. component. So I'll leave that as a little to do note or an exercise for folks here. Um, and this is a uh, void function here. All right. So with that said, let's go ahead and this time, instead of just creating the sprite 2D component uh, outright, we'll create our game entity here. So let's go ahead and set this up. And instead of doing our test here, we will create a game entity, uh, which I'll also call uh, test here. And let's see, we didn't have anything interesting in our constructor other than the actual ID. So let's call this, um, and we want to give it a unique name here, ghost. And we can be able to look that up by reference. Maybe we would want to store these kind of things in a map so we could do quicker lookups and so on. Um, and then on our test here, we're going to do add our sprite component ID. And we need a image here. So we'll go ahead and do that. And again, on test here, we'll call uh, our render function here. Now, again, we we're going to have to actually um, follow the same thing as our uh, render here. So actually, let me crack that uh, before I try to uh, rebuild here. We will need a render window. And let's see, that should do the trick here. So let me go ahead and copy this as well. And now we have the right function. Because it is possible that in SFL we'll have multiple windows to render to, so we have to pick one. Okay, so with that said, let's go ahead and save that file and give this a compile, see if we've done anything um, silly here. And in fact, we have our M components here. We need to pass in uh, where we are rendering for that particular component, which is the ref. And now we'll try to rerun this, run our program, and hmm, well, I don't see our actual component here, so let's see uh, if we made any mistakes. So let me just go ahead and clear this out, and we might have to hop in here and just see what we've done here. Again, we call test, we render our window here, and let's see here, we've got our component. So a couple of things come to mind here when we're adding our sprite component here, if we look at this. One thing is we're gonna to wanna to see what type of component that we're actually adding here and how is it being treated. Because we didn't see the ghost this time, the suspicion here is, well, we just have an I component here and it's treating this as a sort of uh, I component here, even though that we've specifically added it as a sprite component. So I'm gonna recompile this with GDB here and rerun it here. And let's go ahead and just put a uh, breakpoint at say line 57 here at 57 and I'll go ahead and do a source view it's a little bit easier to uh, see for us and let's go ahead and run this program and it might uh, pause for a moment here but um, if we go ahead and print out our components 
we'll see that uh, it looks like we do, in fact, uh, have one here. And uh, let's go ahead and print uh, maybe what is m components at i. And it tells us that it's an i component here. So let me go ahead and just move to the uh, next line. Uh, I'll try to rerun this command. What is m components at i? And again, we are seeing that this is an I component. So uh, what's happening here, um, it looks like we actually want a pointer here for our I component. And why is this? Well, this is how um, polymorphism sort of works for inheritance-based polymorphism. We have to be able to call the right uh, I component at runtime. Otherwise, it looks like it's just being treated as a uh, regular component here. So there is a fix here. So when we actually create our shared components, and I'm going to do these as smart pointers. So we have our uh, memory library here. And I'm going to be using smart pointers to just take care of ownership for me and make life a little bit easier. Uh, so this is going to be a shared pointer the I of I components. So I'll do the same thing here. Shared pointer of our sprite component. And when I am calling render, um, let's see, this will dereference. Actually, let me see, I'll get one compile error here. Yep, let's need the arrow. And ah, it looks like I need to uh, fix my constructor here um, for the actual shared pointer. It's not enough to just, uh, well, we can give it a name here. And then I need to do standard equals make shared. Um, and then make sure uh, I'm making a shared pointer of the sprite 2D component to the right type, and then calling the uh, constructor here. Now you can check out my um, 2D series if you want to understand a little bit about why we're using uh, make shared here. In fact, let me make it a little bit uh, more clear here. So you can see that we're creating our shared pointer of the sprite component and then initializing it um, as shown here. Uh, oops, this is just the wrong uh, function name here, which I'm sure many folks caught right away. There we are. Now I've got the actual type and now it is building here. So you can see this all in one um, line here. Uh, it's a bit of a mouthful and you could use things like auto if you wanted, but um, I like to be super explicit. And now let's go ahead and uh, since we've recompiled this code and there's no error, let's go ahead and um, give this a run, this time without GDB. Um, and now we see our ghost because we are getting the right uh, functions called at runtime. Okay, so this is another sort of design thing uh, with our components here because we have this collection here and I'm going to modify it. Again, I'm using smart pointers to make life a little bit easier, but these are a vector of pointers now. Uh, so again, that we know the type of component we have is a sprite component or an audio component. And that's pretty cool uh, that we have that working now. Okay, now the last thing we really need before we get this up and running is to actually just specify the positions. And we've got a few different decisions here. Again, in the uh, actual game entity here, uh, I'm just setting the position here. Uh, again, and it'll actually make a little bit more sense to probably set these in a transform component that we can control. So for now, what we can do is just make this a little bit of an expensive uh, operation where we loop through all of our uh, components and set their position uh, so, um, as needed here. So I'm actually going to uh, do this here. And uh, well, we'll need a set position function here for our sprite uh, 2D component. And I'm just going to call this X, Y. And we directly have as part of our sprite, again, if I open up the uh, SFML documentation, a uh, set position function that I'm calling here. So dot set position X and Y here. Okay, but it'll stay in sync with our game entity function here. Okay. And we'll call uh, set position and it'll do MX, MY. 
Now we're going to want something again with a transform. This makes it a little bit easier because we could pass a transform into uh, a transform component, excuse me, into the actual sprite 2D component. And then we could also do stuff like if we had colliders and so on to consistently make sure we have the same transform. But ideally, we're going to want some sort of design like this. OK, so with that said, let's go ahead and uh, recompile this. Uh, let me make sure I save after making some changes. Recompile and make sure that I actually uh, spell everything correctly. So set position. And this was just called uh, oh, another Vim uh, error here. So let me make sure that I change this uh, word here to set position. There we are. OK, and we need a return type here. And this is just going to be void for now. OK, so if I rebuild this, um, oh, that's looking a little bit better here. Just need to make sure that our component has this set position here. So again, this is where we need to make a little bit of a design decision. I can take a shortcut here and just create a virtual uh, void function here, sort of similar to what I did with the render. Um, or what I could do is actually just, again, assume that this component is a uh, sprite 2D and do some sort of cast, which is what I'm doing here. It's going to be a little bit safer uh, to actually just make this a virtual function here. And then we'll do a little bit of refactoring uh, later on here um, in the series. All right, so let's just go ahead and do something like that. And again, I'm not uh, making these purely virtual functions because I'm going to want to actually refactor this when we think a little bit about the uh, interface a little bit more. Um, but here we are here. So let's actually start setting uh, some of these positions of our ghosts and uh, complete our project here. And what I'm going to go ahead and do is go ahead and let's go ahead and create uh, a bunch of entities here. And let's perhaps have a vector of uh, game entities. Uh, I'm just going to call these entities here. And let's have a loop for i. Let's say we have 50 for now. That seems like a, a very reasonable number. And let's go ahead and create each of our entities. We'll give them names. And maybe we want to do something like standard to string, pass an i here add the sprite component, and then ultimately add them into our entities uh, collection here. Uh, our test entity. And then uh, we'll also want this um, loop somewhere to update all of our entities. So let's refactor uh, that just a little bit here. So draw all of our sprites. For and i, i equals zero, i less than, well, however big our collection is. And you might be asking why I'm not using range based loops or any of that stuff, and that's uh, for clarity <laughs> for this lesson here um, and these kind of things. Um, an iterator, since would show the intent a little bit clearly, uh, more clearly of what we'd want to do, that is iterate through everything. So let's make sure that this is building. It is. Uh, and we'll want to set these positions somewhere reasonable. So let's go ahead and um, just generate some random numbers here. And I'm going to do this uh, most simply using the uh, random or the standard lib here. Um, from C, and I'll do the C++ style here, and I just need to generate some random numbers here. Modern C++ has lots of interesting uh, ways to generate random numbers uh, that I think are going to be uh, too much um, for what we actually need here. Uh, I just want to use something like this, srand. Um, I actually might need to include the uh, time library here as well. And that's part of C time. And I include C time versus time.h so that I can have everything in the uh, standard library namespace, um, just so that I don't um, have any name collisions in case I have created something called time here. 
So again, let me make sure that those imports are working. Um, a few different uh, errors here. So the size here and line 101. Okay, so now we can generate our random numbers here. Um, and again, this will just be with uh, Rand here. And let's just mod it by, uh, I don't know, our Windows 400 by 400. So this will be the uh, X position. Um, and we'll do the same thing for the Y position. So it'll give us two random numbers here. Um, oops, let's go ahead and at line 103, X position and Y position. Okay, should be able to recompile. Let's go ahead and see. This looks pretty good here. We've got a bunch of random ghosts. So now let's actually make them move around and update them. And then we will be complete. And we're just going to do a simple sort of screensaver here. So let me go ahead and just grab this uh, loop here. Um, oh, actually, I can uh, do this a little bit more simply. Uh, each of our entities, we will set their position. And well, if we're going to set their position based off of their previous position, let's say, well, we'll need to store that or need a way to get uh, that information back. So we're going to need a get position X, get position Y, for example. And we're also going to need something like a direction, for example. Uh, the idea with this little screensaver is that we'll have these uh, little ghosts bouncing back and forth in uh, different directions here. Uh, so how will we be able to handle that? Well, let me give you the sort of um, shortcut here for sake of uh, completing this video here. Um, let's go ahead and in our game entities be able to get the uh, X and the Y positions. Uh, so I'm going to do float get X position and this will just return the MX and we'll do the same thing with Y. So we'll go ahead and do this here. Make sure that we return the right member variable. This is const because we're not modifying anything. So we'll try to uh, use good practice there. And uh, as I mentioned, what would we want to do if we wanted to add some sort of bookkeeping here? We have a few different options. Um, I can opt for, for example, for simplicity, uh, something like this here. And I just create the um, X direction and I make it say positive and the uh, Y direction. Uh, and then it'll move, uh, each of our little ghosts will move in one of these directions. We can sort of randomize it to make it a little bit more interesting. Something that I might like to do instead for each of our game entities is have some sort of map and then a type so you could dynamically add um, essentially member variables. Uh, so you'd add something called X direction as a string, add the actual value here, and then you could look up those values, parse the string, and then update it. Now that would be a little bit slow, but that would be a way you could dynamically add some information to your objects and have behaviors driven by those dynamically added uh, behaviors. For the purposes of this uh, lesson to do, uh, I'm going to make things very simple. <laughs> just as a disclaimer here. Uh, again, you could try something with a map. You could, again, have a transform component and you could model different velocities and so on. Um, but let's just go ahead and get this um, completed and then we'll go ahead and uh, move forward here. Um, so previously we were just updating or incrementing uh, every position by one. Um, so I want to do something similar for that as well. And again, I'm going to break things out um, a little bit uh, to make things uh, simple or readable here. Uh, so let's get the uh, X position and we'll repeat for the Y position. Now most C++ compilers will in fact uh, do this substitution for what I'm going to do here uh, for you so you don't create all these extra variables. Um, and let's do something like uh, that here, X and the Y. Um, and then let's add a little bit of logic. So move, um, keep our entities in bounds. So what we'll do here is say if uh, the actual X is greater than, well, how big is our window that we created? It's 400 by 400. 
and we can actually do this. Um, let's actually use the SFML documentation. So I'm consistent with what I've been doing in this series as I've been uh, teaching folks. So if I look at our render window, let's see how we get the height. And let's see here. So this is a git uh, height or git window width here. Let's see if I can remember here. Um, might be in actually the window, which it inherits from. So we get all these things here. We could get these things as a uh, vector or so on. Um, yeah, get the size, get height, get window. Oh, I guess we just have to get the size as a vector. For now, I'll just hard code it as 400 um, here. Um, and actually, um, then the M of oh, entities at I. Um, let's see the M or the direction. Let me see exactly what we name this here. Just the X direction and Y direction. So you can see we've already broken style here. <laughs> um, equals minus one here. So something like that here. And then we do the uh, opposite here. If we're less than zero, then our direction is just one. And then we're going to do the same thing for uh, X and or excuse me, for y that we did for x. So for greater than 400, then our direction needs to be minus 1.0 f here. And let's be a little bit consistent here. All right. Um, and instead of just adding uh, one here, we can add the whatever the entity's uh, direction is. So x direction. And do the same thing for our entity's y direction. And that's just flipping between negative and positive. So let's make that a little bit bigger just so you can see uh, the logic of keeping everything uh, in bounds. Let's give this a compile, see if we made any mistakes. Uh, amazingly, none here, but let's see if it works. <laughs> and it sort of works here. Uh, so you can see all of our ghosts moving around here. Now, um, I am a little bit uh, actually less satisfied with how this is uh, moving here. Um, they seem to be going uh, off the screen here. So actually, let me do one more logic check. <laughs> um, um, and that looks like a copy and paste error since they're disappearing <laughs> on the bottom of our screen here. Uh, and let's actually... Since we're making these part of the class here, let's randomize these just a little bit here um, so that they move in different uh, directions just to make it a little bit more interesting for the purposes of this lesson. So to do for the purpose of this lesson, randomize X and Y direction. And the actual uh, velocity that we are moving. So in order to do this, we'll set X direction equal to some random value and let's have it between um, you know something reasonable so we'll generate a, a random number between um, zero and uh, or actually let's say one and four and depending on what that number is let's go ahead and just um, or maybe one and five here and I'll subtract uh, three from that number so whatever we get here so if we get a, a one, for example, uh, we'll subtract three and it'll start off moving in the negative uh, velocity here. Okay, and then we'll do the same thing for the uh, y direction. And let's go ahead and set these up here. And just to make this uh, a little bit consistent here, um, what I wanna do here is, instead of just setting these to negative one is just invert it. So this will just be, uh, so whatever the direction is that it was moving to move it out of bounds, just multiply it by uh, one or uh, negative one here for all of these edge cases. All right, so let's go ahead and give that a try. It compiles and it runs and it gives us something uh, interesting to look at here. That's kind of fun. All right, folks. So. 
in this lesson, this was a monster lesson, maybe as long as all the previous ones in this series here, but we've successfully created this little screensaver that's kind of fun here. We also have a game entity class so that we'll be able to think about how we can group things together. And we've built a little component system that we're able to add components. I've also talked a little bit about the different architecture that we might want to think about. Like, are you going to have components that are renderable or non-renderable? Where we might want to add a transform and why we want, might want to do that. So I hope you found this useful. I hope you comment below if you have other critiques or ideas or questions about this design here. Remember, this is going to be a little bit of an iterative process, but I think it'll be insightful for you just to see some of the questions that I think about as we sketch this system out. If you enjoyed this lesson, if you got some value, please like and subscribe as it helps the channel. And I hope you've been enjoying this series. We've got more for you, so make sure you don't miss it. Take care, folks.